Well, welcome to all of you sitting here in the, in the theater at the University Center at the University of Montana, and welcome to you who are joining us through the magic of live streaming. Welcome to the tr mock trial of Leonard Higgins. Uh, my name is Jeff Smith, and I will serve as the court clerk this evening. To begin with, in a departure from normal court procedures, um, the defendant, Leonard Higgins, asked for several prayers. And it is my um, pleasure to welcome Eric Huseth, who's the spiritual leader of Our Savior Church in Bonner and also a member of the uh, Climate Action, Faith and Climate Action Group in M Missoula, and John Crawford, who comes to us from the Blackfeet Dakota Nations and um, is a member of the Local Indigenous Network Collective link here in Missoula, whose mission is to protect Montana's headwaters and to unify communities of action. Good evening. My name is Pastor Eric Kieseth. I'm pastor, as Jeff said, at Our Savior's Lutheran Church, and it's an honor to be with you this evening. What this event challenges us to do is stand up in front of very powerful forces that are desperately and aggressively seeking the status quo for their own protection. They are powerful and the work is hard. And of course, we can feel incredibly daunting sometimes and overwhelming and scary. Given this reality though, here's another reality. Almost all faith traditions that I know of, in some shape or form, are rooted in standing up and doing the impossible. Whether it be Buddha in the mountains of Nepal seeking to free oneself from an oppressive system of hierarchy, or Muhammad calling out idolatry, or Moses freeing a nation from slavery, or Jesus and his ragtag group of country kids taking on the Roman Empire, Faith traditions can empower us to stand up. In the book of Exodus, it reads, But Moses said to the Lord, O oh my Lord, I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor even now that you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. O oh Lord, please send someone else. These are words that could have come from me. Maybe some of you gathered in this room as well. Please send someone else. But then the Lord said to Moses, Who gives speech to mortals? Who makes them mute or deaf, seen or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you are to speak. This is the hope, I think, of faith traditions. Not a hope of, I'm going to judge you, not you need to do this perfectly, or not that you've got to get results by this time. It's really all about you are not alone. We do not do this work alone. You know, a common word used by both Jews and Christians in Hebrew is Amanuel, which simply means God with us. Please send someone else. No, because it is us that need to do this task. It is us that need to stand up and make known the terrible death and damage that is being caused every day by climate change. It is us that need to say you cannot blow carbon into the air free of consequences anymore. And here's the thing that I pray for tonight. Emmanuel, God with us. We are not alone. For nothing is impossible with God. And so let us pray. O oh God, may you walk with us as we face the challenges ahead. Be with Leonard Higgins, who is a model of courage during this time of trial. Walk with us as we proclaim the greatness of your creation, speaking out against those who pollute this planet and put our lives at risk. And may we be faithful witnesses of hope and determination as together with you we seek a more just, 
free and equitable earth for all. In God's holy and many names we pray. Amen. Good evening, and I'd like to thank you all for being here tonight. The one I would like to like to say is get across is the is the environment in which we all share here in Montana. We're going to have an excellent term, and that was medakoyasin, meaning we all are related. In one way or the other, we are related through spirit or through deed, and through our voice in which we want to speak for the earth and for to keep it safe and to keep it for our children and our children's children. I would like to send a prayer to those not only to strengthen to you, but help to strengthen Leonard in this time that's going to be coming ahead in times of trouble. So keep that in your heart and in your mind that we are all related. We are related in many ways. We are related through spirit and we're related through kin. We're related to those things that become important to us and that give us the power for us to speak up for those who cannot speak. We cannot speak, in my mind, we have to have the power to speak for those who cannot. Not only for those people who cannot, are, are un, um, who are troubled and unable to speak for themselves, but also for the land and the water that cannot speak. We have to be their voice. So I ask that you send those prayers out as you go home and as you cross to wherever you travel over this next week to go visit family, that you share those prayers for the land and the water and those beings that share this world with us. So I say a prayer that you take your power as an individual, use it, and you take the words to heart that we all are related and share that energy that you have to speak up not only to help Leonard, but to help the other things in this world that are needed and need our power and need our help. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, John. Um, so we are here now to get down to business, to try the case of Leonard Higgin Higgins for the alleged crime of criminal mischief for shutting off the Spectre Express Canadian crude tar, sand, tar sands oil pipeline not much more than a year ago near Coal Banks Landing, Montana and allegedly causing more than $1,500 damage. Mr. Higgins did this in concert with four other activists who together for one day at least shut off all the tar sands, crude oil entering the United States. <laughs> Mr. Higgins acted commensurate with the truth of unfolding climate disaster. And tonight, Valve Turner, Leonard Higgins will argue the necessity defense as he would if he were allowed to in the courtroom in Fort Benton next Tuesday. If he were allowed to in Fort Benton, of course, it would take several days for these experts to, get, to give the case that, that Leonard would present. Um, so tonight, we have a very concentrated version of that. And um, this is a mock trial. In one sense, this is pretend or drama, but you are authentic members of the jury, are you not? And as such, you are the jury of Leonard Higgins' peers. And the purpose of this trial is to seek the highest sense of truth and justice in accordance with the highest principles of our civilization, as intended by the founding fathers of this nation, each of you are the conscience of our community. And tonight, you shall determine the nature of justice. Leonard and his expert witnesses are playing themselves, of course, tonight. And then some other people, like myself, are playing parts to bring out the uh, necessity defense. And according to the law, as jury, 
you are free not only to judge the facts in this case, but the law in question. As the supreme governing body of the United States, a jury is bound by no laws of its own. A jury can make a ruling on whatever grounds it wishes. So now, all rise. This court is now in session. The Honorable Ju Judge Bob Gentry presiding. Oh, sit down, please, sit down. <laughs> Court is in session. Can you hear me? Council, as you know, we have a, a preliminary matter that we need to take care of before opening statements. Uh, the prosecution has filed a motion to uh, prohibit Mr. Higgins from offering expert testimony in support of the necessity defense. Is that better? The prosecution argues that the necessity defense is not allowed under Montana law. I rule on this issue as follows. Counsel. <coughs> In certain cases, a defendant who undertakes an act may admit to facts which, standing alone, might result in a criminal conviction. But if an accused can prove facts justifying their actions, a trier of fact, a jury, or a judge sitting in a bench trial may conclude that the defendant is not guilty of the underlying criminal charges. This is known as an affirmative defense. In Montana, affirmative defenses are set forth in statutory law and they're informed by common law or judge-made law. Contrary to the prosecution's arg argument, the necessity defense falls squarely within Montana's statutory compulsion defense which is codified at MCA section 45.2.2.12. As recently as 2009, the Montana Supreme Court confirmed that, and I quote, the statutory defense of compulsion merges with the common law defenses of necessity, justification, compulsion, duress, and choice of two evils. So in asserting a necessity defense, Mr. Higgins must prove four elements. First that he faced a choice of two evils and he chose the lesser evil. Two, that he acted to prevent an imminent harm. Three, he had a reasonable belief that his action was necessary to avoid or minimize or mitigate the harm. And four, he had no reasonable legal alternative to his action. The defense table has summarized these elements in the chart behind them there. So an essential function of our judicial system is to facilitate a jury of peers examination of relevant facts as applied to guiding law to reach a just decision re regarding the criminal culpability of an accused person. This is a cornerstone of our judicial system and of our participatory democracy. And I intend to uphold this foundational principle. Justice, of course, strives to be blind and fair but it simply cannot abide within a vacuum of willful ignorance of relevant facts. I therefore deny the prosecution's motion in limine and I will allow testimony from expert witnesses and the defendant in support of his affirmative defense of necessity. So ruled. And without further preliminary matters, the prosecution represented here by Counselor Summer Nelson may proceed with their opening statement. Counselor. Court, Your Honor, Counsel, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you have been called here to perform an essential function of our democracy and our system of justice, and your, your duty today is, an, is a critical one. But you will also find that the question before you tonight is rather simple and straightforward. And that is because Mr. Higgins himself will get on the stand and tell you that there are no facts in dispute. He will testify that he was there on Enbridge property and he did not have permission to be there. 
He will testify that he turned a safety valve on their oil pipeline without any training or expertise. And he will testify that he planned to stop the flow of Enbridge oil and that he actually accomplished that. So why are we here today? Because Mr. Higgins believes that he is above the law. He may pick and choose which laws to follow while the rest of you remain law-abiding citizens. Mr. Higgins chose to violate the law that day in order to make a point about his beliefs about climate change and to create a show that he could post on the internet. And now he is bringing that show to court and he will complicate those simple facts before you that are undisputed by putting on experts to talk about climate change and to try to justify him choosing to break the law that day. But we have a rule of law for a reason. It keeps order, it keeps our citizens safe and our energy supply secure. So I am confident that at the end of the day, after you've heard all the testimony and the undisputed facts admitted by the defendant himself, the good ladies and gentlemen of the jury will be able to see through the hype of this show and find that Mr. Higgins is guilty as charged based on his own admissions. Thank you. Thank you, Counselor. And uh, Counsel for the Defense, Arnold Schroeder, will now present uh, Mr. Higgins' uh, opening statement. Members of the jury, there is absolutely nothing normal about these proceedings whatsoever. We can obviously start with the fact that they're taking place in a theater instead of a courtroom. But then we can move on to some, some more fundamental and structural differences that this case, were it tried in a regular court, would have had from a normal criminal case. And the defendant admitting guilt to an actual crime is, in many senses, least among them. What we are really asking you to do that's truly unusual is to take a very, very systemic view of what's happening in our world right now. We want you to ask a number of questions that are all innately complex, and we want you to examine the interrelations between those questions. Has climate change progressed to a point that it can be safely described as a crisis? Have the institutional measures that have been taken or contemplated for that matter thus far to address the crisis been so woefully insufficient that some form of citizen intervention is necessary to retain any prospect of surviving this century? Is there such a thing as an action that a citizen could conceivably take that has any possibility of meaningfully intervening at this stage in this crisis in a, in a favorable way? We're going to bring out experts who are going to testify to all of those things. There's no element of this case and of the defense that we're making that in and of itself doesn't breathlessly, effortlessly meet the criteria it's really the complexity that we, have to, that we have to encompass and envisage to get all the way to a not guilty verdict. And I think that among the many criteria that we'll discuss and the many experts that we'll bring, the one who is going to hit notes of greatest uncertainty in members of the jury, the one that is going to be the least convincing for some of you, is when we ask the question of whether citizen intervention can in fact meaningfully address the climate crisis. Um, I think that the researchers who are, addressing, who are asking whether the climate crisis is happening would put a much stronger confidence interval on their results than a researcher in nonviolent strategy would put on anybody's action at any one place or time having a calculable, favorable result. But nonetheless, we live in a world where all of our actions inherently have probabilistic outcomes. Nobody ever gets to know with absolute certainty the, the consequences of their act. And there's nobody in the world, there's no single person in the world who in and of their own agency could fundamentally solve the climate crisis. It will always be cumulative and it will always be uncertain, the actions that people take to address it. When we are done presenting our expert testimony, you will see unequivocally and clearly that Mr. Higgins' actions fall squarely within these four criteria and that you cannot find the man guilty of any crime. Thank you, counsel. Prosecution may proceed with its case in chief and call your first witness. Your Honor, I call Michael Foster of Enbridge. All witnesses have been sworn.
Thank you, Mr. Foster. Would you please state your uh, name and occupation for the record? Uh, Michael Foster, <laughs> Vice President of Operations, Enbridge Incorporated. And we are North America's largest natural gas distributor. We have pipelines all across North America. It's very good to be here. Thank you, Mr. Foster. And as in your position as Vice President, what are you responsible for at Enbridge? I am responsible for everything. I have a direct line to the, uh, to the CEO, who uh, is responsible for stock prices. And stock prices keep shareholders happy. And when shareholders are happy, then we have more and more energy coming into homes all across this great land. And so really, I'm responsible for everyone from uh, the training, training and operations people on the front lines, keeping the oil and gas flowing through the pipelines. Thank you, Mr. Foster. Can you briefly describe the events that took place on October 11th, 2016, that led to you having to come here today? Yes, 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 I can. Uh, on October 11th, 2016, a telephone call was received in the operations center at Spectra Energy. Spectra doesn't exist. We, we bought Spectra uh, after this happened. So I'm speaking for Spectra. Um, a, a call was received in Spectra Energy Operations, and they followed standard operating procedure. They called their frontline people all of the staff, the first responders, the law enforcement officers, anyone who needed to be notified immediately. And everything happened simultaneously and an emergency unplanned shutdown took place so there was never any danger to the pipeline. Just want to make that clear. We've, we've had lots of experience with spills and, and accidents and things and this was not one. We are not TransCanada, thank you very much. <laughs> and, and how long was the time between that first uh, unexpected call was made to your company and when you yourself were notified of the incident? Oh, almost immediately. Um, I was notified uh, within five minutes. The call came in about 10 and, the, and they said they, they were activists and they gave us about 10 minutes to do the shutdown and uh, we were notified almost immediately. And, and what was the impact of this unplanned shutdown? It was terrible. Um, stock prices dipped, and not, not for long, not for long, but it, it shook the confidence of the energy industry and, and the people who have confidence in the energy industry. And Canadian energy is very important to North America and to the United States. It was very serious. There was never any danger to the pipeline. Understood. And uh, how long, approximately, was the, was the pipeline down? The pipeline was down for about a business day, about eight hours. Um, it seemed longer. Sure. Thank you. I, I have no further questions. Mr. Schroeder, any cross-examination? Mr. Foster, in the sequence of events you described, you said your company had procedures in place for handling these sorts of emergencies, that you essentially always had control over the system. Would it be fair to infer from those statements that nobody got hurt as a result of Mr. Higgins' actions? Oh, no, it hurt. It hurt. Um, our company has a very, very uh, good reputation with, with citizens in both Canada and the U.S., and I take that very seriously. Right, and speaking more to the question of physical injury, did anybody receive any bodily harm from Mr. Higgins' action? Well, uh, no, no, I can't say that there was any bodily harm from this, this action. Um. And keeping in mind that we are in fact weighing evils in this case, that this is a necessity case and we're trying to assess the, the scope of the harm that Mr. Higgins caused by shutting down the pipeline, just real quickly, did anybody die? Did any Objection. major a Ask and answer, Judge. He's badgering the witness. Well, I believe I'm going to allow uh, Mr. Schroeder to continue this line of questions. It seems uh, pretty essential, as you've explained, to an element. 
Right, for so for instance, did a major agricultural region utterly collapse, never to produce food again? Did a fundamental pattern of human settlement, say for instance, a propensity to build on coastlines, have to be utterly abandoned? Any, any, any? Um, I think no. I understand what you're going at, and I want to be clear, life takes energy, and none of us would be sitting here today if it wasn't for Enbridge providing the energy that you require safely and efficiently. Uh, so thank you for, for letting us be the providers for your energy needs. Any redirect, counsel? No, Your Honor. Witness is excused. Thank you. You may call your next witness, counsel. Uh, that's our witness, Your Honor. Okay, counsel. We'll <laughs> proceed to the defense case in chief. Uh, Mr. Schroeder, please call your first witness. All right. Defense calls Dr. Steve Running to the stand. Can you just briefly state for us, Dr. Running, your background, your professional qualifications? I am a retired Regents Professor of Ecology and Climate at the University of Montana. And can I ask a very fundamental and simple question with, I know, a very complex answer. What is climate change? Climate change is uh, basically the, the long-term trends of changes in uh, particularly uh, air temperature and the hydrologic cycle of the, of the Earth. Okay. Um, what's the relationship between burning fossil fuels <coughs> and climate change? Well, this was figured out by Svante Arrhenius in 1896 that uh, burning coal at the time produced carbon dioxide, which even back then was known uh, to uh, have what is commonly called a greenhouse effect uh, that traps thermal energy. And so even back uh, at that time, he predicted that uh, sometime in the future, the Earth would start warming from this increased trapping of energy. And we're seeing that now? And we're seeing that now. Uh, we now have, uh, in the latest records, uh, atmospheric carbon dioxide is close to 410 parts per million. For reference, what was it before we started burning fossil fuels? It was, I think, two, 290. And so, on our current emissions trajectory, what's the magnitude of climate change we can expect looking forward in the future? Our best estimates from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, in their 2014 report is that we expect a global average air temperature increase of uh, about four degrees centigrade by the end of the century uh, this is based on currently trapping about 2.3 watts per meter squared of additional energy in the Earth climate system. Is it safe to say that that kind of temperature change will have cascading effects? Oh, certainly, yes. Um, and is it too late right now for us to meaningfully shift that climate trajectory by shifting are burning of fossil fuels? I think every day that we do not reduce our, our use of fossil fuels uh, extends longer the period that the Earth's reacting with this global warming. Can you describe Montana-specific effects that we are seeing or will see fairly immediately from climate change? The Montana climate assessment that just came out about five months ago showed an average temperature increase of about a half a degree per decade over the last 50 years around Montana. Okay. I don't have any further questions for this week. Any cross-examination, Ms. Nelson? Mr. Running, isn't it true that even after Mr. Higgins took this action, and halted that oil in the pipeline, climate change is still happening. Yes, it is. Thank you. No further questions. 
Any redirect, counsel? No. The witness is excused. Please call your next witness, Mr. Schroeder. <laughs> Defense calls uh, Andrew Holland to the stand. And Andrew Holland will be appearing via teleconference. Hello. Good evening. Mr. Holland, um, could you please uh, describe for the jury your uh, background, relevant professional qualifications? I'm senior fellow at the American Security Project, the American Security Project, National Security Think Tank, based in Washington, D.C. I've been studying climate change for over 10 years at two different think tanks, at two different think tanks, Congress. Could you describe your findings in reference to the national security implications of climate change? Certainly. Uh, uh, we found that climate change is a threat multiplier. That means that uh, the, the military finds that uh, Climate change will impact national security by accelerating threats around the world uh, and uh, harming our national security through uh, by accelerating the, the demand for uh, the military uh, and for our military to, uh, to fight wars, to uh, take part in humanitarian assistance and disaster responses, uh, and it will harm our uh, uh, harm our bases and stations, both here in the United States and around the world. And are other, are other national security related entities, the Pentagon, Defense Department, coming to similar conclusions and authoring similar reports? Yeah, about 10 years ago, the Department of Defense started work on this. Uh, their most recent uh, quadrennial defense review, which is their four-year review uh, of planning document, uh, said uh, the impacts of climate change may increase the frequency, scale, and complexity of future missions, including defense support to civil authorities, while at the same time, undermining the capacity of our domestic installations to support training activities. Uh, they've followed up with what they call their adaptation roadmap. Uh, the director of national intelligence, likewise, has uh, repeatedly asserted that climate change is a threat to national security. Uh, and I should underscore that this planning continues uh, even uh, under this administration. Um, going, into the future, going into the future, what kinds of security threats and issues do you expect to see from climate change in terms of national security? Well, I, I, what I'd go ahead and say is that it's, we don't even need to look into the future. Uh, there's a persuasive case uh, that the war in Syria is deeper and longer because of the impacts of climate change. Uh, the uh, Syria, uh, the Euphrates Valley in Syria uh, was affected by a drought uh, unprecedented in their history uh, in both length and scale that drove hundreds of thousands of people, perhaps even a million people, off of their lands, off of their agricultural and herding lands and into cities like Dara, Aleppo, Homs, uh, places that you may have heard of in the recent fighting. When those uh, folks moved from their farms to the cities, uh, they didn't have jobs, they didn't have things to do, and they also were uh, understandably upset against the central government under Assad. When the Arab Spring started in 2011, uh, there was a lot of them who were ready to go protest, and then when ISIS uh, started up in 2012, 2013,
there was a lot of disaffected people who were eager to uh, participate in, in rebellion and fighting against uh, the government and uh, against outsiders. Uh, so there's a persuasive case that climate change impacted that. Now, I want to be very clear that the, this is not climate change caused the war, but climate change made it deeper, and I think persuasive, there's a persuasive case that it made it longer. Uh, the National Academies of Sciences uh, has agreed with this and put out a report in 2015 uh, agreeing on this. So uh, I think that's an example of what we'll see in the future and what we will likely have to deal with uh, in unstable regions around the world. Great. And so just to be clear about that last statement you made, we don't have to look into the future to see the kind of scenarios playing out where climate change influences a conflict. But do you feel it is safe to say that the Syrian conflict and the way it was exacerbated by climate change is something of a model for future conflicts? In the yeah, I do. And, and I think that that's right. Uh, we only have to look uh, not far into the future. And, and I, I do think we'll see, see more of that. No further questions. Thank you very much. No further questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Any cross-examination, counsel? Any cross-examination, counsel? No, Your Honor. The no. witness is excused. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Schroeder, you may call your next witness, Schroeder, you please. Your next witness. Uh, I'd like to call Tom, uh, Dr. Tom Hastings Tom. to the stand. Dr. Hastings, can you just summarize briefly the, test the nature of the testimony you're about to give us? Well, I'd like to, um, well, I'd like to talk about the nature of nonviolent resistance. Of nonviolent resistance. I'd like to go through some of the empirical studies that have been done and what our defendant has done along those lines. And so you've used the term uh, nonviolent resistance. Can you go ahead and just briefly define that for the? Sure, that means that the conduct is entirely nonviolent, that the person who's doing the action or people doing the action are accountable and transparent, uh, that it is resisting poor policy or practices, and that the uh, actions taken begin to impose costs that tend to bring the, uh, bring the other parties to the negotiating table uh, and that those uh, actionists often promote better alternatives. Is the type of resistance you're describing effective in bringing out social change? Objection, Your Honor. This has no relevance to the question of whether Mr. Higgins was present and took the actions that he will admit that he took. Counsel, as you know, I've already ruled on the uh, relevance of testimony related to the elements of the necessity defense and this testimony seems to squarely meet at least three of those elements. Very well, Your Honor. Yes. There's a, a lot of case studies uh, beginning many years ago in about uh, 1973 by scholar Gene Sharp. But much more recently, there have been uh, empirical studies beginning in 2005 by Freedom House. Uh, they looked at uh, 67 regime changes in the past 35 years in the uh, prior to uh, 2005, uh, and then in 2008, in uh, in a journal, um, International Studies, I'm sorry, International uh, Security Studies, uh, was published uh, a real game-changing uh, study by Erica Chenoweth and Maria Stefan. They looked at 323 uh, maximal goal struggles around the planet, and examined the uh, uh, both violent and nonviolent. Uh, and that empirical research was, it, it is, uh, it's dispositive. Uh, the uh, validity, uh, threat-proof nature of it has been um, challenged unsuccessfully several times, and the results uh, now are very widely known through most activist communities, which is uh, important uh, to, uh, to note. Great. Would you describe Mr. Higgins' actions on October the 11th of 2016 would you define those as civil resistance, nonviolent resistance? I would, classically even. Uh, he was 
calm, he was peaceful, he submitted to um, arrest peacefully, he took care for everybody's well-being, both physically and psychologically. Uh, he didn't admit to it, he claimed credit for it, uh, and um, uh, he had a, a video of his actions, so this was not anything uh, done in any kind of cover-up, was not for personal gain, and uh, as a matter of fact, uh, as we heard from Dr. Running, that while this is imminent, um, uh, the defendant is retired, so I would classify this as entirely altruistic. Could you give us a few examples of civil resistance in the United States? Well, they're innumerable, but um, it goes back even before the United States to colonial America, uh, including uh, the one we all are taught about as children, the Boston Tea Party. But there were many other uh, nonviolent actions um, in resistance to uh, the colonial power of, of Britain, including uh, um, colonial women were spinning their own cloth and boycotting British cloth, and this had an economic impact to the point where several of the colonies, uh, at least eight of them, maybe nine, were basically de facto independent, having their own court system, uh, their own taxation system. Uh, so uh, sad to say the Revolutionary War itself was in some cases almost an afterthought because of the power of nonviolence before that. But then moving forward uh, through American history, you have uh, women uh, attempting to have the vote from the beginning of the country and never got it until women's suffrage began to use nonviolent civil resistance and that's when they got the vote. Uh, labor actions in the tens, uh, tw in, uh, in the 19 teens and 20s and 30s led to the uh, rights of collective bargaining in this country. Of course, the Civil Rights Movement was the uh, sort of iconic movement, uh, and beyond that, then identity rights um, across the board, migrant uh, workers' rights, uh, LGBTQ rights, Native American rights, um, so the, the use of nonviolence of resistance uh, is very widespread and has a very good track record, is part of American uh, practice and, and history. If we're talking about climate change, though, we, we live in a democracy, we get to go and vote. In a situation like that, really, what is the point of civil resistance? It brings in, really, the third branch of government, in a way. Uh, many, many uh, uh, sorts of actions, all legal, uh, in a long campaign, can ultimately produce a point where everything's stalled, everything's blocked, and if the danger is imminent enough, and I think that uh, we, the testimony we've heard from uh, doctors uh, Running and Holland would convince us all that this is very imminent, uh, that when you are blocked from, from uh, engaging in democracy in any fruitful way, uh, that it's time to turn to the third branch. So I view nonviolent civil resistance as working within the system, not throwing the system overboard. Could you give us a few examples of times that the judiciary has been a crucial mechanism in making civil resistance work? Yeah, probably the clearest case is uh, Brown v. Board of Education uh, that was preceded by very brave African-American families attempting to enroll their children in nearby schools only to be denied because those schools are segregated. And over a period of decades, the NAACP uh, eventually chipped away at the terrible uh, Supreme Court ruling of Plessy v. Ferguson from the late 19th century, which made segregation legal, and finally completely flipped that in that uh, Brown v. Board of Education 1954 ruling. There have been other cases. Uh, Native American treaty rights uh, have ascended to the Supreme Court, and they've been reaffirmed by the Supreme Court, which uh, were, were, uh, that was prompted by, for example, uh, in northern Wisconsin, um, uh, Native Americans took the, uh, very openly in front of game wardens, they began to fish in uh, parts of the lake that were not on the reservation, but that were part of their ceded territories from their treaties. That court case wound its way all the way up. So, but it was only prompted by nonviolent civil resistance. Uh, many, many other cases where the judiciary was prompted to move by nonviolent resistance. So we've heard a little bit from 
both Drs. Holland and uh, Dr. Running about the nature and the threat of climate change. Do you think climate change presents a, a logical venue for civil resistance? Yes, I mean, you can't look at the one action as being uh, the, this is where climate change stopped. I think the, uh, the prosecutor had that sort of objection earlier. Uh, but what you have to do, in my view, is look at the campaigns and, and figure out how many interlocking uh, forms there were. And so what I would assert is you show me a campaign that won, and I'll show you a multi-pronged campaign. And if you show me a campaign where all the legal methods were blocked for a long period of time, oftentimes the addition of the spark of nonviolent civil resistance is what makes everything move forward. It breaks the impasse. My final question for you, does it seem clear to you that Mr. Higgins in some sense didn't have legitimate venues for addressing his grievance within institutional frameworks? Yes, well, Dr. Running and other, others have been pointing out this problem since 1988, and activists have increasingly been involved since that time. Uh, so when you hold public hearings and write letters to the editor and, and go lobby in, in elected officials' offices, uh, when you hold public events, when you create documentaries, when you do everything possible, and then at the end of the day, you find the problem is, is not only still sitting there, it's actually getting worse, then, uh, then it's very logical. No further questions, thank you. Your witness, counsel. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Hastings, as we heard earlier, uh, this action taken by the defendant didn't stop climate change. So given that, there's nothing that really can be accomplished by these so-called acts of civil resistance. Isn't that true? Well, in the research, we look at uh, what, what the researchers technically call uh, acts of concentration and acts of dispersal. So oftentimes the acts of concentration, the very intense high-risk actions that are undertaken by people like the defendant uh, will prompt other people to get involved in much lower risk activities like boycotts, like letter writing, et cetera. This has moved public policy many times in the past, and, and of course there's no guarantee that any method will produce victory. Uh, there's a percentage. Uh, these defendants are playing the percentages by the research. No further questions. Any redirect, counsel? No, I think <clears throat> we're great. The witness is excused. Thank you. You may call your next witness, Mr. Schroeder. Defense calls Mr. Ken Ward to the stand. Mr. Ward, we're first going to talk about the safety and risk of your action. I'd like you to give any background, relevant experience or qualifications you have to describing pipeline shutdown safety protocols. Uh, <clears throat> My background and experience on this occurred in the summer of 2016 when uh, myself, Leonard, hey Leonard, and a few other people um, formed a study group uh, to look into uh, pipelines, how they operate, and how they could, uh, with the least amount of risk, be shut down. So when you say the least amount of risk, I'm assuming this is risk of injuring somebody, causing a spill, anything like exactly, that, Exactly, yes. That was not the intention of the action, correct? That was not the intention of the action. The intention of the action that I participated in with Leonard uh, was to successfully shut down uh, tar sands pipelines without causing any uh, damage of any kind. So can you describe some of the measures that you took to ensure that? Uh, well, first of all, as a, in terms of the research that we conducted, we did extensive reading, both online and also in libraries. We consulted with uh, pipeline safety experts. Uh, uh, we studied uh, online videos available of activists in Canada who had done the first such, such actions. Um, and we actually traveled hundreds of miles of pipelines uh, looking at the operations themselves um, and consulted with pipeline experts. And on the basis of that, we devised a protocol for how to safely shut down uh, what tar sands pipelines, and uh, shall I tell you about that? Please, describe okay, the protocol. I'll tell you the protocol. It's essentially two parts. One part of it is the sort of choosing a site, to choose, identify sites that would be, would have the least amount 
uh, of risk. And those, uh, there's several factors that went into that. The most important ones were distance from pumping stations um, and also distance from other concentrations of people, transportation, essentially remote locations. The second part of the protocol was to, uh, for all of us to approach the action itself in a way that would maximize the information given to the pipeline companies themselves. Now, the purpose of the action, uh, the ideal action would have been not to actually even have to shut them down ourselves, but to uh, put the pipeline companies on notice that they themselves would shut down the pipeline. So, um, to do this, we uh, uh, established um, a sort of two-tiered system of informing the companies before uh, anyone at any of our sites even entered into the site. Um, we had uh, a, a dedicated one person in our own operations center uh, who made uh, phone calls to the companies. Uh, in um, more than one of our sites, we also had people on the ground who made those calls themselves. Um, and we also uh, chose to live broadcast every site where we could because we wanted to make sure, we, we knew from one instance in, Calif in um, uh, Canada uh, where someone had shut a pipeline and had called and the pipeline company didn't believe them. Um, so we structured ourselves to live stream such that um, had that question come up, we could have directed the pipeline employees to simply go to our websites and see that we were in fact on site. So really, you weren't actually trying to physically obstruct the flow of oil by turning a valve so much as get a company to initiate a shutdown by telling them you were going to shut a valve. Yes, I think the essence of our actions, or the actions, was to provide a credible, to the pipeline companies, a credible intention to close the pipeline with the anticipation that they would follow their own security protocol and shut it down themselves. Okay, great. So now that we've talked a little bit about the, the crazy experience of becoming a pipeline expert and shutting one down. Let's talk about what led you to, to that point in your life. Let's talk about climate policy, whether there are institutional mechanisms in place right now for addressing the climate crisis, and what your personal background or experiences with trying to get political action on climate change has been. Um, well, answering the second part of that, I've been involved as a <coughs> environmental activist and advocate for 40 years. I'm working on climate change as an activist for over 20 years. Um, and in that period of time, which is quite long, um, in a number of positions, including uh, having served as executive director of state public interest groups in New Jersey and Rhode Island, deputy director of Greenpeace US, um, uh, president of the National Environmental Law Center and a number of other positions but in which I have tried to follow um, and the organizations that I led have followed every available legal avenue <laughs> open to us to attempt to put a, a, a functional climate solution on the table. And as we know, and as Dr. Running uh, testified, we're not on track to do anything. I mean, we are essentially following a track um, that is uh, with barely any change uh, in emissions and uh, we are on track for four degrees of temperature increase by the end of the century when we really need to be, I mean the world's government have sent 1.5 as a safe target and even that's a questionable number because right now having not even gotten to 1.5 the West Antarctic ice shelf is, is in unstoppable collapse. So. Um, so nothing that we are doing has worked. Um, nothing that is being contemplated um, is within uh, the realm of working. Um, but we know that it's doable. We know um, from, from world experience, U.S. and international experience, that it is possible to make abrupt, uh, these kinds of abrupt changes. So our aim is to, uh, uh, is to head in that direction. So what would a policy mechanism that actually achieved the emissions reductions necessary to fall below some of those critical temperature thresholds, what would that look like? Uh, objection, Your Honor. I I'm going to object and move to strike his whole testimony. This witness is claiming to be an expert based on a home study group. And as impressive as his resume may be, none of his personal history is relevant to uh, the necessity defense and, and what actions Mr. Higgins took. Counsel, your continuing objection is noted for the record and overruled. Please continue, sir. Very well, Your Honor. <clears throat> yes. Um, 
I think there are two examples, one in from U.S. history and one from uh, recent international history that are instructive. The U.S. example, we often hear uh, that what's needed uh, is a, a World War II level um, of, of, um, of response, at least in the U.S., uh, and, and the comparisons to war are not exact. Um, but usually that's talked about in terms of mobilizing the nation. Um, but it's also, it is an interesting example in terms of what the federal government can do when it's faced with a real, real threat that, it, that is accepted. Uh, it's, it's, import, it's, it's, it's an important uh, or useful story to keep in mind that uh, the U.S. didn't enter World War II until we were attacked at Pearl Harbor, which happened in the first week of December. Uh, within weeks after that, President Roosevelt called in the heads of the major <coughs> auto companies in the U.S. and said, by the end of January, you are going to stop making passenger cars and you are going to start making uh, war equipment. And they did it. Um, and that's the kind of, uh, you know, within the U.S., that's the kind of response, we w the actions that we would take if we were actually um, uh, credibly to work on this. And then internationally, we have the example of the Montreal Protocol which is an international agreement of governments um, uh, in responding to the threat to the, to the ozone layer that was, that was uh, presented by chlorofluorocarbons. Um, this is a, a problem that was first identified by scientists in 1974. Um, by 1985, we, um, despite industry opposition, uh, uh, world governments moved to set up a system for setting an end date to the production of chlorofluorocarbons. Uh, and we accomplished that, and it happened in a 10-year period. And by setting an end date, just like it would be possible for us to set end dates for fossil fuels, you then create a situation in which the alternatives become economic in a way that they aren't now. Um, and you also are able to do it in a way that's intelligent. So if we were doing that now, we would stop tar sands extractions and coal extractions almost immediately, within a year. And that is the action that Leonard took. In your time as a professional environmentalist, did you ever he hear serious policy discussion among people capable of implementing it about something analogous to the Montreal Protocol or about a mobilization analogous in scale to World War II? No, nothing that we're, the only conversations that have occurred over the last 20 years are all within the realm of what's considered politically doable now. And that won't work. We have to think about this in terms of what, of abrupt political change uh, and what is necessary to avoid destroying the conditions that make civilization possible and we're gonna do in a bunch of ecosystems. Um, we have to work backwards from what is necessary. We cannot work forward from what is seen as politically feasible. And, and it's not merely um, that that's the only way we're gonna get to the change we need. It's that is the only attitude uh, with which we're going to see abrupt political change. As long as we keep talking about this uh, in, oh, solely in terms of what we could pass in the Montana legislature next session, we're not going to get anywhere. So can you describe briefly what some of those politically realistic measures that people probably have heard of, the Clean Power Plan and things Clean like that? Clean Power Plan, cap and trade as a policy, and that's now our, that is our, our, our main uh, solution. Uh, even a carbon tax, which is proposed as, as the most radical alternative. A, a carbon tax is something that would be feasible if we had a Montreal, if we use the Montreal pr Protocol to say we're going to have an end date for extractions. Um, and in fact, this is what happened. Uh, each nation under the Montreal Protocol was allowed to implement it in its own way. And some nations used cap and trade, and some nations used taxes, and some nations uh, used uh, direct enforcement, um, as we would do. But it's only if there is a broad agreement that we have to stop extracting and burning fossil fuels. That is, of course, only one of the ma of many steps we have to take. We also have to reform agriculture and forestry practices. We also have to adopt a different system of values that says that not everybody in the world is going to be allowed to have their own car or fly places for vacations or eat meat every day and have your own independent house. I mean, we're really going to have to achieve some, some broad values changes as well. So in essence, what the situation you're describing is one of a massive disparity between the physical necessities that climate implies and what is being politically discussed in, by major power holders. Yes. No further questions. Your witness, Ms. Nelson. <clears throat> 
Mr. Ward, you don't Thanks contend, so do you, that these actions had any measurable impact on climate change? Oh, it certainly had measurable impact on climate change. We shut down 15 percent of the oil supply to the U.S. for a day. That's a measurable impact. No further questions. <laughs> Thank you. Any further hmm? questions? Witness is excused. You may call your next witness. The defense rests. <clears throat> oh, right. Sorry. <laughs> We're done with expert testimony. Uh, the defense calls Mr. Leonard Higgins himself to the stand. <clears throat> Yes, my itinerary here, the court clerk had, not, had advised me that Mr. Higgins was going to testify. And so pleased to hear that he's here. Hello, Mr. Higgins. Hello, Judge. Mr. Higgins, tell us where you're from. I grew up in Eugene, Oregon. And you're retired now, but tell us a little about your career. Uh, so I worked 31 years for the state of Oregon on large multi-year IT projects. Uh, before that, I uh, worked in construction while I went to college, and before that, growing up, I worked picking beans and as a farmhand on, in bean fields. So you worked for three decades in public service as a state employee. You had five children, and then sometime fairly recently, you decided to shut down a crude oil pipeline. Do you want to describe some of the transition from those two seemingly fundamental different states of being? Uh, yes, I would like to talk about that. Um, so, you know, the way that I lived my life is so typical of so many of us. Um, I, I minded my own business. I expected the people around me to mind their own business. Um, I looked out for my family. I, I did a good job at, at my work, um, advanced my career, um, created security and a future for my family. And uh, about 2007, uh, I began looking forward to retirement. Um, I was at the age about uh, where my mother had died, and I thought about the fact that I had fewer years left than I'd lived and thought about what I wanted to do with those years. As part of that exploration, I, I went to a workshop with a, a woman that became my mentor later on uh, in her 70s at the time by the name of Joanna Macy. She does work that reconnects workshop still, very much doing the work at 88, I believe. At any rate, what she helps people do is to face um, the things that are going wrong in our world, the harms that are being done. And I think all of us at a gut level, we know things aren't right. Uh, we know that it's not right that a very small number of people have most of the world's wealth. We know that it's not right that there's important decisions made about people's welfare, about communities' welfare based on whether there's a profit for a corporation. Um, what the workshop did is let me face those truths and begin to grieve about the way things are and through that grieving, there's, there's a power and, and an agency that can arise. And, and so through that work, I, I left that workshop and continued um, examination at, you know, what was the best place for me to put my energy after retirement. And as I looked at climate change, I frankly, was shocked and scared um, as I looked at what the scientists were saying and I looked at how we were responding, how the federal government was responding, how state governments res were responding at the political and public discourse about climate change. Um, I realized that I couldn't just mind my own business and expect other people to mind theirs. That I needed to do something myself if I expected my kids and my grandkids to have a future. And so um, out of that came uh, a move towards activism. I, I did spend uh, about three years um, 
working, doing regular organizing. Um, several of us from the UU Church in Corvallis and in the community formed a chapter of 350.org, uh, 350 Corvallis. Um, we worked with the city of Corvallis to do a climate action plan. We testified at hearings. Um, we did protests. We trained people uh, to prepare for direct action if Obama, uh, President Obama approved the Keystone XL pipeline. And over the course of that time, I saw that what we were doing had so little impact. And there were so many others that also were doing similar work and not changing things. I read two books. I read Naomi Klein's uh, This Changes Everything, and I read Mary Wood's Nature's Trust. And the first chapters of those books were so depressing. They talked about all the work that's been done since um, landmark environmental protection laws were passed in the 70s and, and the slippery slope that has happened since that time in away from the intent of those laws to actually protect us to where we are now. And when I had a chance to begin doing actions that had some chance to, to elevate the discussion to, as, as Dr. Hastings described, move things. Um, it's so clear that we know how to, to address this problem. We have so many people already working on it. We have the technology for wind and solar, alternative energy to replace the dirty fossil fuels. Um, we have uh, people like Ken Ward that have been working on policy to be able to change the way we do agriculture, forestry, uh, the way we do transportation. And it's the immense power and the deep pockets, the immense profits that the fossil fuel companies are taking that are blocking what we need to do. Um, I think that they're surprised at how long they've been able to hold off the kind of move that we need to make in reducing fossil fuel emissions. That they copied the work of the tobacco companies in sowing doubt, in, in trying to divert attention away, and, and they were very successful in keeping on having profits from tobacco sales for a long time. And, you know, the fossil fuel companies, they've been at this now for, for 30 and 40 years since we knew what needed to change. And I think they're shocked at how long they've been able to do this. So my act in um, participating with the others in shutting down the tar sands pipelines is an act of desperation. It's the only thing left that I see left that has a chance of requiring um, the kind of individual action, the kind of individual commitment to change that we need to address this problem. Order. No further questions. Ms. Nelson, your witness. I have no questions, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Higgins. You are excused. And uh, with no further witnesses, uh, Madam Prosecutor, your closing argument, please. Yes, Your Honor. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, certainly Leonard Higgins is a respectable individual who has a sincere belief. He had a difference of opinion from the oil company that was legitimately and lawfully operating its business. The trouble is that Mr. Higgins chose to address that difference of opinion in a way that was unlawful. It's a bit like preschoolers on the playground. Imagine, if you will, a three-year-old, little Mikey, in the sandbox. He's got his favorite tractor. It's a digger. He wants to dig a trench. Along comes little Lenny. He wants that digger too. But he doesn't want a trench. He wants to build 
a sand castle. Little Lenny has some choices. He can wait his turn. He can ask a responsible adult to help him figure out a solution. Or he can choose to play somewhere else. What little Lenny is not allowed to do is to grab that toy away and take matters into his own hands because he doesn't like what the other child is doing. And yet that's exactly what Mr. Higgins did. He went up to this pipeline company that was operating lawfully. He grabbed their toy away, took matters into his own hands. He filled that trench and built his sandcastle. And today he comes and instead of taking accountability, instead of showing any remorse or apologizing, he instead tries to convince you that he should be allowed to break the rules because he didn't like what was happening. He thought that something else should be happening in that sandbox. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, that is not the kind of behavior that we can sanction in our society. We expect our adults to act responsibly and within the law. I ask you today to focus on the facts before the court, facts admitted by Mr. Higgins himself and testified to by the other witnesses that Mr. Higgins was there on property that was not his and that he halted the flow of that pipeline without permission to do so. And therefore, you must find him guilty of the charges before him. Thank you. I, uh, what? Uh, I'm sorry, counsel. Uh, Counsel for the defense, your closing statement, sir. I think any human being would be moved by Mr. Higgins' testimony. This is not, however, a trial of fact versus emotion in any sense. The facts in this case are clear, and they point irrevocably to a not guilty verdict for the defendant. There's four criteria to be met in an affirmative defense of necessity in the state of Montana. The first is that there's an emergency occurring. We heard testimony today about temperatures which have already risen and will continue to rise under our current emissions trajectories. We heard testimony today about the collapse of a food system and a major conflict ensuing not because of climate change we've already seen, but exacerbated certainly by it. There's the criteria of imminent harm I think in this case, the language could even be more legally restrictive and we, could, we would still meet it. The harm isn't imminent. The harm is underway right now. The harm is happening outside of us as we speak. The lack of reasonable alternatives seems clear to anybody who's tried to do anything in our political system, but climate change really does present a unique case of intransigence among institutions. And we heard testimony from somebody who spent decades of their life trying to use the existing mechanisms and channels for creating change in our society to do anything at all about climate change and utterly failing. And of course, there's the competing harms, the lesser of two evils. In this case, we have something people feel pretty comfortable in a number of cases describing as the end of the world versus the testimony we heard from Michael Foster this evening about the loss of revenue and prestige for the company he works for. I think every one of these criteria has been absolutely, stunningly, effortlessly, breathtakingly met. And I don't see a jury such as yourselves comprised of Mr. Higgins' peers understanding both his state of mind and the frame of reference in which he was operating when he took his action as well as the legal doctrine underlying necessity and find the defendant guilty. My defendant is not guilty of any crime. Thank you, counsel. Thank you, counsel. Gentle people of the jury, with the close of the presentation of evidence and argument, I now charge you with the responsibility of deliberating on the guilt or innocence of the accused, Mr. Leonard Higgins regarding the charge of criminal trespass and mischief in general. As I instructed you previously, you are to consider the evidence according to the elements of the necessity defense as allowed under Montana law. I therefore instruct you 
that if you find that Mr. Higgins violated Montana law, then you may convict or acquit Mr. Higgins, but if you find that he has satisfied the burden of proof on these elements of the necessity defense, then you should acquit and find Mr. Higgins not guilty. I now turn you over to the capable hands of the jury foreman, who is also the court clerk, Jeff Smith. I do not have that presently. That's uh, in my clerk's hands, and uh, he left, and now the jury foreman is here. Now it's your turn. Um, as measured by your applause or other, your vocal cords or other um, noise-making apparatus, do you believe that Leonard's defense has been met uh, in the first situation, that number one, that there was an emergency situation? Do you believe that um, he proved that we are in imminent harm? Do you believe, number three, that there is no reasonable uh, alternative at this point? And lastly, that this was the lesser of two evils? Judge? And the verdict uh, is overwhelmingly not guilty, Mr. Higgins. Uh, Mr. Mr. Higgins, a jury of your peers has found you not guilty of the criminal acts alleged by the state. As an officer of the court, I see evidence of lives falling apart, of sometimes heartbreaking combinations of bad luck and bad choices, or simply a lack of appreciation of our reliance on one another. Pardon me, sir. Your selfless acts of conscience and unbounded compassion for all of us and this sustaining earth fills me with hope. Thank you, sir, for your courage and compassion. And you're free to leave this court with the support, love, and best wishes of all present. Here. Court is adjourned. Could we have the experts and the, the players come up and stand on stage, please? There is a reception immediately following at the Double Tree. We have a room set aside there. You're welcome to join us, please. Thank you all for coming.